I hope you'll keep your Bibles open to uh, Matthew, the 25th chapter, and we're going to be studying from that passage this morning. James, we're going to be in the latter part of James chapter 3 tonight, and we're going to be discussing a lesson I've uh, called the unauthorized source. Uh, we're going to be talking about wisdom. Which kind of wisdom is the right wisdom? Is it the wisdom from God or is it the wisdom of this world? And so I hope you'll be back tonight for our discussion. I appreciate you being here and, and, and being involved in that. I know that it is uh, spring break for some of the schools in the area, and so that probably means that we have some people who are off on trips this weekend and in the coming weeks. So uh, let's be mindful of those people. Uh, we miss them being here with us today, but uh, let's be mindful of them. And uh, let's keep them in our prayers that they may have a, a good week and a, a safe journey home. I heard the story of a, a, a man who got sick. He was real weak. He went to the doctor. And the doctor determined that he had had a heart attack. And so he had to spend a few days in the hospital. His uh, doctor came in to see him one day and said, uh, I'm going to let you go home. But before I let you go home, though, uh, he turned to this man's wife and said, I, I need to talk to you about some things. I need to talk to you in private about some things. So they went into a, a consultation room, and the doctor sat down with this man's wife, and he explained to, to her, he said, you know, your husband is very sick. As a matter of fact, he is at a very, very high risk of having a subsequent heart attack. And, and, and so there are some things you need to do, some things you need to be mindful of, so that this won't happen again. The first thing that you really need to do, you need to cook him three home-cooked, healthy meals a day. And you also need to do all of the house cleaning. He doesn't need to do any of that. As a matter of fact, he doesn't need to do any of the yard work because he's just not able to do that. And, and then, maybe most importantly, you need to keep his life as stress-free as possible. And so what that basically means is you can't ever disagree with him. Well, he had this meeting with this lady, and she considered those things. And then uh, it was time for her to take her husband home. So they're, they're on their way home from the hospital, driving down the road. And her husband turns to her and says, you know, I'm just curious what the doctor wanted to talk to you about. And she said, well, I was afraid that you were going to ask. And see, this meeting, in this meeting, the doctor says to me that you are a very, very high risk for a subsequent heart attack. And the bad news is, there's not one thing that we can do about it. <laughs> we have a lot of fun talking about marriage, but I want to bring to your attention how important it really is. Uh, marriage is one of those great institutions that God established in this world for our benefit. It was the very first great institution, as a matter of fact, that God established. You can read about it in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24 where it says a man shall leave his, father and, uh, his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's the beginning of marriage, the first great institution in this world. You know that government was later established by the Lord, and it was authorized and verified, uh, as you can read in Romans 13. The, the last great institution, of course, is the church. Jesus promised that upon the rock of the confession that Peter made, that he was the Christ of the Son of the living God, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And so we know that the church was established, another great institution in this world. It's interesting, though, when we think about the family, when we think about the home, and when we think about marriage, that very often God uses the things that we know about the home and the family to teach us lessons about the church. He uses the physical home, to teach us about the spiritual home. And you can see evidence of that in several New Testament Scriptures. Like, for instance, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15, and Ephesians 5, uh, that whole passage there, beginning in verse 22 and going through verse 33. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to study a lesson here in Matthew, the 25th chapter. It's really a, a parable that is told. Most Bibles give it this title, the parable of the ten virgins, or perhaps yours says the, the ten bridesmaids. We're going to study a, a lesson this morning about what happens in the physical family, really relating to a marriage ceremony as it occurred in the first century, and we're going to relate that to lessons that we need to understand and hold true in the spiritual family, in the church. Now, 
When you look at this story in Matthew, the 25th chapter, I'd like to remind you that depending upon culture, many of the customs of marriage change from time to time. As a matter of fact, if we attend a marriage ceremony today, and many uh, who are here this morning were here yesterday for the wedding of Malachi and Amanda, the beautiful ceremony that was held here yesterday afternoon. And, 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 and when we go to a wedding today, we note that, for instance, the bride is usually the, the very center of attention. seems like everything is built around her walking down the aisle. And, and she is the one that everybody is looking at and watching. I mean, you know, you see the groom, you see the preacher, and you see the, the attendants in the wedding party, but you know, you're really concentrating on that beautiful bride. That's our custom today. But I would remind you that weddings during the Bible times were much different than today. As a matter of fact, uh, when you look at the story here in Matthew, the 25th chapter, you're going to see uh, a number of different customs that they observed in those days in the first century. And let me explain some of the varying customs. The first thing you'd probably need to remember is that there was not a specific time for a wedding ceremony to take place. Not a specific time. Now today, we know exactly when a wedding is going to occur. I mean, there is planning involved in it, and there is an announcement, invitations go out, and in that invitation you're going to be told it's going to be like at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, or uh, 7 o'clock in the evening. You know exactly the time. But in the first century, they didn't know exactly the time. At least the people waiting on the bridegroom to come did not know the exact time. Very often it occurred at night, though. You might need to keep that in mind. Secondly, much of the attention in those days was placed upon the groom's arrival rather than the bride's. I mean, see, this is foreign to us. You know, the, the groom is stuck back here in this back closet, okay? And he, he kind of walks out at the right time just waiting on the bride to come down the, the, the aisle. But in those days, it was totally different. Uh, the center of attention was on the groom's arrival. And then third, and perhaps most uniquely, the groom in the first century would come from his house to pick up the bride's uh, the bride and her wedding party at her house. And then all of them would basically parade back through the streets of the community. Remember, normally this was at night. And they would have lamps. And they would return to the, the groom's house where there would be the marriage ceremony. And then get this, a week-long feast. A week-long feast. Again, very different from us. We have a marriage ceremony, we go and have a reception that lasts just a little while, and then typically the bride and the groom, they go on their way, usually on a trip that we call a honeymoon. You see the difference in the customs from today and then the first century. Well, I think that's helpful to know, to observe those customs, because when we come to Matthew, the 25th chapter, we're going to see a story about a marriage ceremony taking place. But the real purpose of this story being here is to remind the church, the spiritual family, about another great event that we need to be prepared for. And if you look at the, the context in which this story appears, not just concentrating on Matthew 25, but if you go back into Matthew the 24th chapter, you can see that this story comes on the heels of the Lord teaching about being ready for His second coming. So that's the whole idea here today as we study this, this lesson about first century marriage to remember that the lessons we're learning have to do with the Lord's second coming. And if you just really wanted a, a key thought for today's lesson, if you can remember nothing else, you want to remember this thought. This lesson is all about getting ready and being ready. Getting ready and being ready for the Lord's second coming. If you can't remember anything else we discussed today, Make sure that you are getting ready and make sure you're staying ready and you're being ready for the Lord's second coming. So here are the things we want to discuss today in this lesson. We're calling the, the name of the lesson, Lessons from Ten Virgins. And there are five things in the next few minutes that I want to bring to your attention. The first of these uh, comes from verses 1 through 4, the verses that were read just a few moments ago. Th this is about the arrangements. If you remember a moment ago, I stated that one of the main differences in our weddings today and, and 
comparing to weddings during Jesus' day, is that most of the attention back in those days was placed upon the groom's arrival. The bride and her attendants in this story are called uh, virgins or bridesmaids. They are waiting on the bridegroom to come, to come to her house and to pick them up, to, to take them back to his. And again, there would be a ceremony or a festival that would last about a week that would follow. Now, the groom is important in this story. And of course, the bride is important in this story. But the story really focuses in on the ten virgins. And it really is about their preparation, or perhaps in some cases the lack thereof, about being ready to do their part in this um, parade back through the community with the lamps and such like. Now, besides being there as a support for the bride, one of the, the things, perhaps one of the major things they were expected to do was to have a lamp and have oil for that lamp so that they could be prepared. And that's the the key word here. The expectation on the ten virgins had to do with making arrangements or making preparation so that they could be ready to do what they were supposed to do. Now in this story, you can see that five of these virgins are described as wise. And the reason they were described as wise is because they had their lamp and they had the sufficient oil to do what they needed to do, to provide light. But on the other hand, there were five others, they're called foolish. And they had a lamp, but they didn't have the extra oil, as they should have had. And so you may say, well, what what does this mean for us today? Well, there's some things that we need to keep in mind, some practical lessons. We need to remember, number one, that the um, ten virgins in this story actually represent the church. You can see in verse 1, then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. And so, these ten virgins really represent the church. Um, it's interesting that the church is often portrayed in Scripture as the bride of Christ, like it is in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2 and in Ephesians chapter 5. But here, the, the virgins in this story represent the church. Second thing you need to remember, Jesus recognizes two kinds of church members, two kinds of Christians, if you will. And some are wise and some are foolish. The third thing you need to remember, the foolishness of those who were foolish really was not a matter of something that they did, but it was, it was a matter of something that they did not do. Uh, we would suspect the five foolish virgins were just as morally upright as the other five who were called wise. They also had done some of the very same things. They, they brought their lamps, but they failed to do some things they should have done, particularly to be, to be better prepared and have the extra uh, oil for their lamps. And so I would ask you today, in terms of this story representing the second coming of the Lord, when we talk about arrangements, I would ask you, are you making arrangements? Are you making preparation for the Lord's second coming? Remember a moment ago I said that if you can't remember anything, remember that this lesson is about getting ready and staying ready. Getting ready and staying ready for the Lord's second coming. What kind of arrangements are you making? I would say to you that because this this story represents the church, I would say to you that it's so important that you make the necessary arrangements to be a part of the church. And the only way you can be a part of the church is to become a Christian. And the only way you can become a Christian is to obey those simple principles that the New Testament lays out for us. The principles of believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. John 8 and verse 24. Repenting of your sins so you won't perish. Luke 13 and verse 3. Confessing Jesus before mankind. Romans 10 and verse 10. And then being baptized, of course, for the forgiveness of your sins. And when you're baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, as you see the people did so in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, the Bible also says that they were added to the church. So that's how you become a part of the church. That's how you get into the church. You obey the the gospel plan of salvation that we just rehearsed, and you become a part of the church. Are you making the arrangements to be a part of the church? Have you met those qualifications 
to be a member of the church. In a little bit, we're going to sing the invitation song, and it'll be the perfect time if you haven't obeyed the gospel to do so. Not only will you be saved, but you'll be added to the church. We're not going to ask for a show of hands if people accept you here, because if the Lord accepts you, we accept you. You can become a part of the church today, and you can get into this group. You can get into this story that we're reading about. You can become a part of the, the ones who are waiting on the arrival of Jesus. Now remember, it's about making sure you're doing the right things and, and making sure you are making the necessary arrangements. So, so getting ready and staying ready and being prepared for His arrival. Staying ready would have to do with staying faithful. Being a faithful member of the Lord's body. And we are promised those who remain faithful until death will receive the crown of life. So what arrangements are you making? That's one of the key things to remember in this story. The second thing that I want to bring to your attention this, this morning about this story is the anticipation. If you'll notice at the first of verse 5, it, it states that the bridegroom was delayed. The bridegroom was delayed. Now remember, in the Jewish culture in the first century, the bridegroom could come at any time. And as a matter of fact, William Barclay in his commentary, he states that one of the things that the, the groom liked to try to do, it was kind of like a game, he would try to come at a time when he thought the bride and her attendants were not prepared. I know that doesn't sound like, well, it does sound like something a guy would do, doesn't it? <laughs> it doesn't sound like a very nice thing to do, but it was just part of the culture again. And, and he would perhaps try to come at a time when they were not expecting Apparently they were expecting him. But something happened and he was delayed. Uh, one version says he was late. Another one says he was a long time coming. Basically what this means is he didn't come when they thought he was going to come. Have you ever been to a wedding when the bride or the groom happened to be late? I've never seen that. I've never seen that, but I, can, I cannot imagine, though, the anticipation level that would arise if one or the other were not there when it was time for the wedding to begin. Now, the amazing thing about this story, and that, that's part of the application for us, is even though the bridegroom was delayed, he was a long time coming, even though he was late, some of them were still not prepared. Some of them were still not re prepared. With the extra time that they had to make preparation, you would think that they would have been prepared. But in this story, even though he was late, some were still not ready. Of course, the thing that we need to understand as we make application here is that the coming of the groom in this story represents the second coming of Jesus, as we've already stated. And, and there are many people today, just like in Bible times, who are living with great anticipation for this event. John, who wrote the book of Revelations, did so. Some of the last words in that book, he wrote, Revelation 22 and verse 20, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Many of the New Testament Christians lived with the expectation that the Lord could come at any time. But unfortunately, there were some who were not anticipating the great event. 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4 refers to scoffers who would come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, saying, where's the promise of His coming? Doubting it, thinking it wasn't going to take place. More importantly, we need to learn today that the delay of the groom in this story is emblematic of the uncertainty of the time that the Lord will come. That's the bottom line. We've got to anticipate the second coming of the Lord, because we don't know when it's going to happen. It's an uncertain event in terms of the timing of it. It's not uncertain as if it will happen. It will definitely happen. It's uncertain as to when it will happen. And if you look back into Matthew 24, as I told you earlier, at verse 36, Jesus said, but concerning the day and the hour, no one knows. He's talking about His second coming here. He says, concerning the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son. He's saying, I don't even know. Right now, Jesus is up in heaven, and He's waiting on the Father to say, it is time. It is time for you to go back. And then He reiterates that in verse 44. Uh, when, when He says, therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. 
That's why we've got to anticipate the second coming of our Lord. The third thing that I bring to your attention this morning concerns the appointment. It says in the ESV that they all became drowsy, referring to the ten virgins. They all became drowsy and they slept. The New King James says they slumbered and slept. It appears to me that the ten bridesmaids in this story who are slumbering and sleeping represents the idea of death. As a matter of fact, we know that the Bible teaches it's appointed for men to die once, and then after this, the judgment. See, we know for sure that death comes to all people. Death comes to the Christian and the non-Christian. Death comes to the faithful member of the church and the unfaithful member of the church. Now sometimes in the New Testament, death may be in reference to being unprepared. Or rather, sleep, I should say, may be in reference to being unprepared because they, they slumbered and slept here. And some would say, well, maybe this, this means that they were unprepared. Uh, and sometimes it does, though. Romans 13 and verse 11 says, now it's high time to wake up out of sleep. Romans 13 and verse 12, the night is far spent, the day's at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And so sometimes, yes, sleep does represent the idea of being unprepared. It does so like in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 30. But sleep also is used to refer to the dying. And even the saved who have died. John 11 and verse 11, Jesus said, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go to wake him up. And of course there is that passage in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52 about sleep, how it represents those who have died. And in that context, representing even those who have died in Jesus. We sang a song just a few moments ago about our body sleeping in the, the cold clay. That is a reference to how we will die. We will be asleep when we die. So it seems sleep in this passage refers to the appointment of death that all men will keep. There's only one exception to that. There are going to be a select few, as you consider all the people who have ever lived, there will be a select few who will be alive at the time of the Lord's second coming. That could be today. We could be a part of that select few. We might not ever physically die, as in the sense of uh, Hebrews 9 and verse 27. And if that occurs, then that means the Lord has come during our lifetime. But in most Cases, in most cases, especially knowing those who've lived in the past and obviously all those who've died in the past, they fit this description of those who slumbered and slept. Those who've slumbered and slept are those who have passed away. That brings us to the appraisal that will take place. Now let's, let's read beginning in verse 6, going down through verse 12. But at midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. So he finally comes. Come out and meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were gone to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. The bridegroom finally comes, but before he comes, he is heralded by someone who goes before him, saying, The bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. It was a matter of custom in those days, as a matter of fact, for someone to go before the bridegroom and to announce His arrival. This might be similar in our custom to like the song they play as the bride comes down the aisle. You know, the song starts. The mother stands up. And, and that signifies that the bride is about to come in. Well, what does this signify for us today in terms of there being a, a herald about the bridegroom coming? It, it can only mean one thing, it seems to me, and that is the announcement of the bridegroom corresponds with the trump of God. 
that shall sound as Jesus returns, as 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52 states. And then at that time, the Lord will come again. And you know what will take place after the Lord comes. The judgment of all the people who have ever lived in the earth. Judgment will occur. God will judge the world through His Son, Jesus Christ, according to Acts 17 and uh, verses 30 and 31. And according to God's Word, here's the important thing to remember here, according to God's Word, each of us individually will stand before Jesus and an appraisal of our conduct will be given. Romans chapter 14, verses 11 and 12 state that every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12 says, So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. We know that if we live long enough and Jesus delays His second coming, that we will die. And we know that when Jesus comes again, we'll all be called into the judgment. And there, we will give an account of ourselves to God. An appraisal of our conduct will take place. And what we know for sure, based on this story, there will be some who've made the necessary arrangements. They have gotten ready. And they have stayed ready for the Lord's coming. And there will be some according to the final appraisal, who will have not been found faithful. Notice in verse 10, I don't think this little event is there without a reason. In verse 10, the last five words states, and the door was shut. And the door was shut. After the bridegroom arrived, back at his house, the door was shut. The ceremony began. And those who were not there could not change the circumstances. They tried to. They came up and knocked on the door. They wanted in. But they had not been ready. And I would remind you, at the judgment, there's no changing what's happened. Our, our fate is sealed, so to speak. The door will be shut. The door for changing the circumstances. Notice in this story that those who were unprepared when the groom came, those who were unprepared, they tried to borrow from the preparation of those who were prepared. Isn't that interesting? Is it possible that that signifies that perhaps on the day of judgment there might be some who will try to borrow from the preparation that others have made? Do you think it's possible that somebody might stand before the Lord and say, but you, but you know, Lord, my mom and dad were Christians. And when I was a kid, I went to church every Sunday. Is it possible some may stand there and say, Lord, but, but, but my spouse, my spouse was a Christian. And I never stopped him or her from going to services. I thought it was a good thing as a matter of fact. And you know, every now and then, at Christmas and Easter, I went with them. Is it possible? Some might try to borrow from the preparations that ever, others have made. Is it even possible that those who are Christians but have not been faithful may stand before the Lord and say, well, you know, Lord, I was baptized. When I was 13 years old, I was baptized. And you know, Lord, I, I always came to church. I hardly ever missed. But then what about, about some other things that were true of their lives that did not add up to what the Bible describes as being a faithful child of God? You, you see how it might be possible for someone to, to try to borrow from the preparations of others or, or make some type of excuse at the very end? You know, if I'd only just... I had to go get some extra oil. And, if, and now I've got it. And now I'm ready. But the bridegroom said it's too late. The door was shut. Which is really the final point. And that is the admonition in verse 13. Here's the lesson. Jesus says, the lesson is, I say to you, 
I do not know you. Then he says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The implication is, you don't know when the Lord will come again. So what must you do? Always be ready. Remember the key thought today? Get ready. Stay ready. Get ready. Stay ready. Because we don't know the day nor the hour the Lord will come again. Heard the story of a man who was traveling through the back country of Switzerland. And he came upon this beautiful lake, and right beside it there was a large estate. Beautiful house, beautiful gardens. The man knocked on the gate, and a keeper came to the, the door. The man said, I, I was just passing by, and I wondered if I might be able to take a tour of the property and the gardens. He said, sure. I, I'm the one who is the groundskeeper here. He started to show him around, and it was just a beautiful place. The, the lawn was immaculate. The, the garden was well-kept, beautiful flowers and shrubs. And, and he said, you know, I'm just curious, where's your master? And, he, and he said, the groundskeeper said, my master has only been here four times in the last 24 years. And the man said, you've got to be kidding. He said, it looks like that you're ready for him to come back tomorrow. And the groundskeeper said, not tomorrow. I'm ready for him to come back today. That's the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach us in Matthew, the 25th chapter, about the second coming. Don't be ready tomorrow. Be ready today. Tomorrow, be ready tomorrow. But today, be ready today. Have you made the necessary arrangements? Have you, are you a part of the church? Have you obeyed the gospel and gained entrance into the church? And have you stayed ready? Are you being faithful? That's the, that's the question. Always live in view of the judgment. And the, the time to be ready is right now. And we ask you that question as we close and offer the invitation. Are you ready? Are you right with God? Or are you ready for Him to come again? If not, change it. Make the necessary arrangements as we stand and as we sing.